So here we have, so we've got, we're going through three or four different examples of using hash functions for authentication, but they have different purposes. In this example, the purpose is not for confidentiality, it's just for authentication. So there's no encryption of the message. In the previous example, there was also encryption of the message. Sometimes we want to encrypt the message, sometimes we don't need to. In practice, if we don't need to encrypt the message, it's more efficient in terms of performance not to, because encrypting a message takes time and effort. So in this case, we encrypt only the hash function. And in all of these mechanisms, the way to understand them is to look at what can, a, what can an attacker do? How can they break it? So what we went through, and I try to draw again, the two different approaches. The first approach, so the attacker intercepts the message. So this is sent across the network. The attacker intercepts. So they take a copy of, or they intercept before it gets to B. And as we saw on the board, one option is the attacker can modify the message. So instead of being M, it's M prime, a different message. So they change the message. But they don't change the rest. That stays the same. And then they send that, all of this, on to B. And then we look at what does B do? Well, all B does is follow these, follows these steps. When they receive the message, they take a hash of that received message, and then they compare that calculated hash value with the received hash value, which is H of M. In fact, in this case, they must first decrypt this received value and they'll get H of M, they'll compare that with the hash of M prime and one of our desired properties of hash functions is if we have two different input messages we'll get two different hash values. So here we have M is the input of the hash function and at the receiver M prime is the input of the same hash function two different inputs, we'll get two different hash values when we'll compare they will not be the same and when they're not the same, the receiver assumes something's gone wrong. They don't trust what they receive. If it is the same, they assume it's okay. There's nothing gone wrong. So there's no way to detect what's gone wrong. It's just dete detecting something has gone wrong. That's sufficient to provide security. So that, the top is showing one simple approach for an attack. Just change the message. Doesn't work in the receiver detects that. The bottom case is, well, can we do something else? Let's change the message and recalculate the hash of that message. So take M prime, calculate the hash, but we need to encrypt that with some key because the receiver expects it encrypted with some key. Here, it, the attack fails in that the attacker doesn't know the secret key K, so they must use some other key. Let's say they randomly guess a key, try and guess K. Of course, we assume that K is large enough such that they cannot guess it in reasonable time, so that it'll be some other K here, K prime. This is sent to B, the receiver. B follows the same steps. Receive message, M prime. Hash of M prime is at this side. Hash of M prime, but here, this is what's received, decrypt using K. It was encrypted using K prime. When we decrypt using a different key, either we'll detect that there's something gone wrong, it doesn't successfully decrypt, or we get a different output. Because when you decrypt a ciphertext with the wrong key, the plain text you get out will not be the same as the original plain text. So if that's the case, the original plain text was H of M prime. If we decrypt this with the wrong key, we'll get something different than H of M prime. We'll get the wrong plain text. And therefore, we'll compare it to H of M prime, and again, they'll be different. So the receiver detects, because they're different, something's gone wrong. Any other way that the attacker can try and defeat this security mechanism? What else can they try? So here was change M, 
without changing the rest. Here, change m, change that, recalculate the hash, but we don't have the key to encrypt correctly. Anything else? Encrypt with a different e. A, it will not help because we'll get the strange output here. And remember, the algorithms are known and agreed upon. If M uses AES with a 256-bit key, B will use AES with a 256-bit key. And the attacker knows they're using AES with a 256-bit key. The algorithms are publicly known, so we assume that. So even changing the algorithm will not help. It'll make things worse. Anything else? You're an attacker, how can you defeat this system? Well, I think we've covered the two main approaches. What else can we do? Well, what else can we change such that it will not be detected at receiver? I don't think there's anything in this case. If you're lucky, it, you change the message, okay? Or let's say in this case, we change the message and the hash of M prime is the same as the hash of M. So if it's a, such that the hash of these two different messages, M and M prime, are the same, then it will go undetected. The attack will be successful. So that leads us to why we have one of these properties. If, using the top attack, we just change the message, if the hash of M prime, as here, equals the hash of M, then the receiver compares them, finds them the same, and assumes everything's okay. And that's a failure of this security mechanism in that the receiver has received a message M prime, which is different from what was sent. So, that's why we require hash functions to hash, produce different hash values with different inputs. If it didn't, if it produced the same hash value with different inputs, this mechanism would not work. Or another way, and a more practical requirement, is it, it should be hard for the attacker to find another message, M prime, with the same hash value as M. So if you know some message M and you know its hash value, it should be hard to find another message with the same hash value. In theory, it's possible. What we need in practice, it will be practically impossible. That is, it takes too much time to find. So we'll return to that when we look at our properties. The previous case, example A here that we went through first, is effectively the same, except we now encrypt the entire message. So again, if you look at what the attacker can do, you'll find that there's nothing that they can do that will go undetected. If we modify the message, well, it's all encrypted. We cannot do that. In fact, in this case, we don't really need the hash function because the encryption itself provides a form of authentication. Because if we encrypt something, and we send the ciphertext, and someone changes that ciphertext, then when, when the receiver decrypts, they'll get an error or get the wrong output. Assuming they can detect that the output is wrong. That's where the hash function comes useful. The key in this case provides the authentication that it came from the right user. If it successfully decrypts, then it must have come from someone who knows key K. And from B's perspective, the only other person in the world that knows key K is user A. Because by definition, K is private. It's shared between the two. No one else has K. There are other variations as well. We'll just go through two or three examples. This is a different one. Here we're going to use a hash function to provide authentication. No confidentiality. The idea is that both A and B have some shared secret S. 
Okay? A has the value S, like a secret key. So does B. No one else knows S. We're not going to use S for encrypting anything, though. You see in here there's no E or D. There's no encryption. What we do is we take our message. A takes the secret value S and concatenates with the message and we take a hash of that. So we hash of the message in the secret. Send that, oh, combine that with the original message and send across the network. So what B receives is the message concatenated with a hash of the message and the secret. And what B wants to do is confirm this message came from A. That's the objective of this one. Make sure the message came from A. So what they do is they take the received message combined with their, their known secret S, take a hash and compare with the received hash value. If they match, B assumes this came from A. If they don't match, it assumes something's gone wrong. Try and defeat this. You're the attacker. Show me how to defeat this. Try it. Look and try and find the different things the attacker can do such that when B receives a message, it thinks the message came from A, but it came from someone else. Think about what, what can possibly go wrong. So the way to think about it is try and draw on here on your own notes and think, okay, what if, oh, what if the attacker changed this value or changed this other value? What would happen at the receiver? Would it be detected or not? Try and work through it for a few minutes. Discuss with your friends and see if you can defeat this. So remember the objective here is for the receiver to confirm that the message came from A. That we cannot perform a masquerade attack, pretend to be someone else. Anyone have a way to attack this? There's one theoretical way that we can defeat this. In this case, we're not, about, we're not trying to modify the message as an attacker. We're trying to, let's say, send a message and B should think it came from A, but in fact it came from the attacker. See if we can draw some...
So in this case, the attacker, if they s generate a new message and send it to B, what can they do? So the attacker generates a new message and send to B. What can they send such that B thinks it came from A? Well, let's just make note, what is sent here? It's the message M concatenated. So we take M and we concatenate here with a hash of the message concatenated with the secret. That's what's sent normally. The hash function is applied on the secret and the message, and we also send the message. What can the attacker do? Anyone want to attempt? So let's say the attacker wants to send a message and pretend to be from A. They take some message, any message. doesn't have to be the same as M. M prime. So what they would do is concatenate that with the hash of M prime concatenated with what? S prime. S prime, let's say. Because we don't know S. So if that's what the attacker sends, the receiver follows the, the procedures of take the message received, M prime, combined with their value of S, so here we would have M prime combined with the secret S known by B and shared with A and take the hash of M so here that we would have the hash of M prime and S and we compare with the hash this value would be the hash of M prime and S prime That is, what's received by B, the hash value received is this. And B takes the received message, M prime, combines it with their value of S, concatenates, takes a hash, and now compares these two hash values. Are they the same? No, because S is different. Here we have S, we have S prime. The attacker needs to know S for this, to be, this attack to be successful. If they don't know S, then when B receives the message, they'll compare, and since B uses its value of S, their secret, they'll know that it came from someone else, it didn't come from A. Okay? So that's how this one works. How can we defeat it? Or what does the attacker need to do to defeat this? Hmm? Find S. How do we find S? We cannot guess. Assume S is a 200-bit value. Guessing is a brute force attack which won't work. So how do we find a S? Try and find S, given the in public information here. Find S. How could, how could the attacker find S? Again? Okay, if the attacker... Remember, this is what was originally sent. If the attacker intercepts that, they know M. That's fine. M is not supposed to be private. They know M. And they know... Let's assume that they know the length of the hash value. Because the hash... Hash functions have a fixed length, so if the hash function is known, the length of the hash value is known. So the attacker knows this value. Let's say the hash value is 128 bits and the message is the rest, let's say 10,000 bytes. So they want to find S. What do they do? Try every value of S. That takes you 10,000 years. I'll wait for you to finish. Anyone else want to do it a bit faster? It's not a, 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 
we, we'll assume that brute force attacks will not work. So on a key or on a secret, we just say it's large enough such that trying every possible value is not a feasible approach. What else could we try, though? Interrogate. Interrogate. <laughs> yes. uh, again, we assume that if A has S and B have S, they've somehow secretly exchanged them. They don't have to send them across the network. So let's say in a private letter they exchange the value of S. So we assume that secret is secret. And there's no way to find that through other means. Okay? We cannot interrogate someone and ask them for value of S. Again? Inverse H. The attacker knows H of M concatenated with S. If we could calculate the inverse, what could we do? Yeah, if we could calculate the inverse, we'd get MS. That is, the attacker knows H, the hash of M concatenated with S. If we could calculate the inverse, then we would find M concatenated with S. And then it's easy to find S. Because if you know M, and we do, and if you know M concatenated with S, then S is the leftover. OK, and that leads to our requirement. But we cannot calculate the inverse. We've said one of our desired properties of the hash function is that it's one way. We cannot calculate the inverse. And here's an example of why or when we'd require that property. So if we could calculate the inverse, let's see how it works. And then let's see, uh, come back to our, requ our requirements. So if, so this is known. This is known by the attacker. So what we do is we take the inverse. And let's say this value here is lowercase h. So that's uppercase m, the message, and lowercase h, the hash value is known. So what the attacker does, takes the inverse hash function of lowercase h, and what's that return? M concatenated with S. So if we could calculate the inverse, we'd get M concatenated with S. So we know M, we know M concatenated with S, therefore it's easy to find S. Because if M is 10,000 bytes, M concatenated with S is 10,000 bytes plus 128 bits, that last 128 bits is S. There's no encryption going on there. It's just joining two values together. So it's easy to find S if we can calculate the inverse. And once the attacker knows S, then they can pretend to be someone else. It's no longer secret and no longer secure. So this is an example or a demonstration that if we want this mechanism to, to work for authentication, we need a hash function where calculating the inverse is impossible or practically impossible. So our hash functions have different requirements depending upon their use. In this case, we require the one-way property, the inverse, to be true. Uh, the inverse to be hard to calculate. Yes. And we saw in the previous example, we required this property that the hash of two different values should not lead to the same hash value. If that was true, then the previous mechanism worked. If it wasn't true, the attacker would break the previous mechanism. So demonstrating those properties. Any questions on that one before we move on? So this only this is only broken if the inverse hash can be calculated. And in practice, if we most in, most hash functions, it cannot be calculated. It takes too much time. This is a similar one. We will not go through in any detail. It's the same as the previous one, but we then also encrypt the message. So we use the secret in the same way, but we also encrypt the message. So we can combine them. There are other combinations as well. 
why would you choose one over the other? Well, there are different advantages, especially avoiding encrypting the message is good for performance. So if you want to provide authentication, if you need to encrypt the entire message, that takes time. Okay? So if we can provide authentication without encrypting the entire message, that can lead to better performance. So sometimes we don't want to en encrypt the message. Either we encrypt a hash of the message, which is smaller, or we don't use encryption at all, like we saw in the previous one. So that's the comment here, that sometimes we'd like to do authentication without having to do, authentic without having to do encryption. Because encryption takes time, it requires resources, it can be slow in software. If you need hardware to do it, then there's an extra expense. Uh, if we, in some cases, even encryption hardware is not very efficient if we have a small amount of data, it's only efficient with large amounts of data. And of course, encryption algorithms, some have patents. You need to pay a license to use it. So there are costs involved with doing encryption, therefore sometimes we want to avoid that. So the previous four used hash algorithms to provide some form of authentication. In a later topic, the next topic, we'll see an alternative form which is called message authentication codes. We will not talk about that now. That's in the next topic. But there's a relationship with the hash function. The previous cases, when we did use encryption, we used symmetric key encryption. Here we'll use encryption but public key encryption and we'll arrive at a digital signature. Let's see the process. The first one we're going to provide a signature and in the second one we're going to provide a signature and provide a secret message or a confidential message. So the second one, the second diagram here is also provides a signature like in the first diagram but we also encrypt the message. So let's just go through the first one. Here we're trying to send a message from A to B and when B receives the message we want to confirm that it came from A. We don't care if someone else sees the message and we'd like to be able to prove that it came from A. And like a signature, when you sign a document, handwritten signature, that's some form of proof that it came from you, that you uh, recognize that, uh, that document or that text. Okay? And later it can be proved that you agreed to that document. Because okay? in a year's time when someone sees that piece of paper with your signature on it, that's proof that you agreed to that. We want a similar thing with a, a digital message. Let's see how it works. We take our message and we want to sign this message. So to sign it, we take a hash of the message and the main reason here to take a hash of the message is for performance. We take a hash of the message and then we encrypt using a public key algorithm using the private key of the source. So this is the source user A. We encrypt using, for example, RSA and the private key of user A. So we encrypt the hash value of that message. We concatenate with a message and send the message and this encrypted hash value across the network. The encrypted hash value is referred to as the signature, the digital signature. So in fact we have a message and a corresponding signature. We send them. The receiver receives and the receiver uses the public key to verify that signature. So we take the receive message, calculate a hash of the receive message, and compare with the receive signature. And we can decrypt the receive signature using the public key of A. If they match, then everything's okay. If they don't match, then we don't trust that signed document. First, before we go and look at what an attacker can do, here we're using 
a private key of A to encrypt the hash and then a public key to decrypt. We say that using uh, the private key provides some signature of a document or of a, of a file, of a message. We could have used, what if we used symmetric key algorithm here? Instead of RSA, use triple des, for example, and use K here and secret K here as well with a symmetric key algorithm. What's the difference? Same except here is K and here is K and that, that a symmetric key algorithm is used. Okay, you're, you're correct. If, if we use symmetric key algorithm where same approach, take a hash of the message, encrypt with secret key K, decrypt with secret key K, the symmetric key, they both have the key K. It will work, except how many people have the key K? Two. Two, two people have the key K. Now, this is a, a problem because B receives, or B has this document. Now, later we want to prove to someone else that this message came from A. Can we do that? The, the message could have been encrypted by B because B also has key K. So with symmetric key cryptography, both two users in the world have key K and hence the message could have came from either A or B. There's no way to prove that the message came from A because both A and B have the key. So maybe B is a malicious user they create this signed document using the key K, there's no way for anyone else to prove that that signed document was from A because it could have also been from B. Whereas with a public and private key pair, if we encrypt with a private key, only one user in the world has this private key, user A. So now if we have this signed message, if we decrypt with the public key, and it successfully decrypts, it confirms that that signed message originated at A. And that's proof that the message came from A and no one else in the world. And that's what a signature is. Assuming that your signature cannot be forged, then your signature on a document means that this document is signed by you. No one else in the world can sign it. But with a symmetric key cryptography, it possibly came from two users. With pub public key cryptography, it must have come from just one user. So there's the difference of using symmetric and in this case public key cryptography. So a digital signature is provided just by using public key cryptography. We cannot use symmetric key cryptography. Of course, the other problem with using symmetric key cryptography is that if someone else, a third party, wants to confirm, here's a signed message. We want to confirm. So user C wants to confirm that it came from A. So in this, with public key cr cryptography, they just need the public key of A. That's public. But if we use symmetric key cr cryptography, we would need the secret key K to confirm that it came from either A or B. So here, by having a public key, anyone can confirm that this message is from A. And that's what a digital signature is. Confirm that some message come from one particular user. Any questions on but about that concept of a di digital signature? And that's important. We see signatures are used in a lot, a lot of real uh, network communications. So importantly, a signature is when we encrypt using the private key of the source. This is user A, encrypt with A's private key. A signs the message. In fact, we don't need the hash function. We could encrypt the entire message. But for practical reasons, A, when we use the encryption of the hash value, is much smaller than the message. So if the message is 10 megabytes, and the hash value is 128 bits, 
encrypting the hash value is much faster than encrypting the entire message. So for practical reasons, we encrypt the hash value. So a signature is encrypting the hash of a message with a private key of the source. And it can be verified by anyone that has the public key of that source. Try to attack that scheme. Think about what an attacker can do to make someone think that the message came from A, was signed by A, but it, it's a different message, for example. Change M, see what happens. Or see what's required to change M. If you change M, then you're right. You need to determine the private key. What else can happen? Or well, one way is to determine the private key. Anything else? There's another approach. Try and work out what what can an attacker do such that B has a message and thinks that message has been signed by A? See what the attacker can do. I think you'll see quickly, if you know the private key of A, you can break that. But we assume that the private key of A is private to user A. No one else knows it. What else can we do? Try and work it out. So see what an attacker needs to do to get something undetected at the receiver. And I'll try and come up with a diagram. Anyone have a, an attack that you can perform? Or what's required for a, an attack to be successful? First, let's see what happens if we try some simple things. What if we just change M? So the at attacker intercepts what happens. So we intercept the message, and the attacker changes. So what was originally sent was M concatenated with the signature of M. So let's just change M to be M prime. And let's not change anything else. A simple attack. So concatenate M prime with the previous value that was sent, which was encrypt using the private key of A of the hash of M. So in this case, so here's M prime. What the attacker has done is taken the receive the receive value sent by user A, and they've just changed the message. So I'll just write down what was sent by A.
to m. So that's what's originally sent by A. The attacker takes that and just modifies the message. They don't need to change the signature here. Let's say the message again in an example is 10,000 bytes and the signature is 128 bits because our hash value, our hash function produces a 128-bit output. When we encrypt that, we get 128 bits of ciphertext. So we can say we have 10,000 bytes of message and 128 bits of a signature. That is sent by A. All user, the attacker does is takes the first 10,000 bytes and changes them to whatever the message they like, M prime. And take the last 128 bits and concatenate that with their new message, M prime. Then they send what happens at the receiver B. B takes the hash of the received message, so we get here the hash of M prime, and then they take the received signature, which is E, the encryption using the private key of A, the hash of M. They decrypt using the public key of A, so the output here is the hash of M. and compare. And this is M prime. Are they the same? No. Assuming our property of our hash function is true in that here we have two different messages, M and M prime. We take the hash of them, we should get two different hash values. If we do not and we compare, then now B detects something's gone wrong and therefore doesn't trust the message. If they are the same hash value, then B would assume that the message is signed by A and would trust the message. But in this case, they should be different, assuming our hash function has this property that two different messages, two different hash values. So that attack of just changing the message doesn't work. It doesn't fool the receiver. What else can we do? And it's similar to what we've seen in the other mechanisms. What else can we do as the attacker? Again? Okay, if we receive this, we modify the message, recalculate the hash value, H of M prime, and then encrypt with some private key. But what private key? We don't have A's private key, it's private. If we encrypt with a different private key, the private key of C, and then send, you'll see similar, that the receiver will take the M prime, get hash of M prime, they'll take the signature, which was encrypted with the private key of C, they, when they think it came from A, decrypt with the public key of A, something goes wrong here, we'll get the wrong output here. So if, we, if the attacker tries to recalculate the hash and use a different private key, because B uses the public key of A, again we'll detect, detect something's gone wrong because we're using different keys for encrypt and decrypt. Anything else we can do? So we see that the attacks that, that we've, and we've seen them in the previous examples as well, are unsuccessful and what's, what's a requirement on our hash function in this case? And I think we've seen it before. So this demonstrates this requirement that the two different hash, hash values of two different messages need to be different. If they weren't, then we could defeat this signature. More precisely, if the attacker can choose a message M prime which has the hash value which is the same as the hash of M, then they can defeat this security mechanism. So if the attacker can find M prime where the hash of M prime is the same as the hash of M, 
then the signature mechanism does not work. And that's one of the important requirements of hash functions. It's not just that we have different hash values. In fact, in theory, some messages will have the same hash value. In practice, what it should be is practically impossible for the attacker to find, in this case, to find another message with the same hash value of the existing message. Given M, or given the hash of M, it should be practically impossible to find another message M prime which has the same hash value. And that leads to some more details about our properties. We will not go through this simple hash function today. We'll go through that another time. <coughs> Let's return to our properties, but in a more formal manner. So we've said so far, we've demonstrated two properties. Two hash, the hash of two messages should produce different hash values. And the other property is this one-way property. If you, can, if you know the hash value, it should be practically impossible to find the original message. Okay, we've seen examples of how if we don't have those properties, our security mechanisms will fail. Let's look at them in more detail. And we introduce some new termination, terminology, pre-images and collisions. For some hash value h, lowercase h, which is the hash function of x, x is called the pre-image of h. Just some terminology. We've said that the function h is a many-to-one mapping in that assuming, and in, always in the case of uh, how we use hash functions, because our input message can be larger than the size of the output hash, we'll always have multiple input messages that map to the same hash value, which defeats our, or is against our requirement of security. See if we can draw that. This many to one mapping. Let's keep it simple for the first example. Let's say we have a hash function that produces a two-bit hash value. H is two bits in length. And our hash function, let's say, takes four-bit messages as input. In fact, it may be uh, a hash function should be able to take a variable length input, 4 bits, 3 bits, 5 bits, whatever. Let's consider the example, our hash function takes a 4-bit message and produces a 2-bit hash value. How many possible messages as input? How many possible messages? 16, 2 to the power of 4. Or not. You can list them all. I will not give them all. 0 all up to 1111. So there are 16 possible messages. Say M1, M2, M3, up to M16 in this case, with a 4-bit message. How many possible hash values? How many hash values? 4. So we take a, a hash function, h, takes a message and produces a hash value's output. And the hash values h1, h2, h3, h4, okay, in this simple example. Will we, will we have two, two different input messages that produce the same hash value? Yes or no? Yes, we must in this case, because we've got 16 inputs, we've got four possible outputs. Some of these inputs must map to the same output. 
Which, what is the mapping? Well, that's what the hash function determines. But we know for sure that we cannot have unique outputs for all the possible inputs. For example, this message with our hash function may map to this hash value. M2 maybe to a different value. M3 to one value. Some of the messages must map to the same hash value. On average, how many? How many messages map to one hash value? Four, because here we have 16 inputs, four outputs. So on average, four messages, assuming there's a random mapping, four messages map to the same hash value. We've just gone through mechanisms and we said a requirement of it for our security is that we cannot, that we do not map to the same hash value. But here, in this simple case, if the message is larger than the hash length, then we will map to the same hash value. Using our terminology, we say, for example, in this case, M2 is a pre-image of H1. So in the slide, X is a, a pre-image of the hash value. And we have a many to one mapping. Many messages map to one hash value. In this example, on average, four messages map to one hash value. When multiple messages map to the same hash value, we call it a collision. Okay? A collision of those messages. So here we have a collision. We don't want those in, in practice. So this is the definition. A collision occurs if the two messages are different, but the hash values are the same. Collisions are undesirable. We've seen from our security mechanisms, if we have collisions, our signature and so on will not work. So what do we do about that? Well, how many collisions do we have? Or how many pre-images? In this case, we saw four on average. In general, if H takes a B bit input, so the input is B bits, in our case it was four bits, there are two to the B possible messages. In our case, there was two to the power of four or 16 possible messages. And for an n bit hash, ours was a two bit hash, and where B is greater than n, which is normally the case because in practice we need a small hash value and we, allow, we need to support many possible messages. So, and usually variable length messages. So the size of the message is larger than the, the length of the hash. Two to the n possible hash codes or hash values and on average if we have a random distribution two to the b minus n pre-images for each hash value. That is two to the b minus n messages mapped to the same hash value. If M is five bits, how many messages? 32 messages on input, and H is still two bits. Still we have four possible hash values. How many collisions? 32 mapped to four, so we have eight, on average, eight messages mapping to each hash value. And that's two to the power of five minus two equals 2 to the 3 equals 8. In general, 2 to the power of b minus n. We'd like to, that value to be small. Um, we'll see some other requirements uh, shortly. So we have some problem. We're, in theory, we can have collisions. We will have collisions if the length of the message is larger than the hash value, which is uh, useful for practice. But for security, we don't want collisions. So let's look 
at some requirements, uh, some more specific requirements of our hash functions. Cryptographic hash functions. So hash functions used for security, for cryptography. So for practice, we need a variable or we need a function h that takes any length input. The message can be a thousand bytes, ten thousand bytes, a megabyte. We'd like our hash function to work on any length input. And we'd like a fixed size output. And usually small output. Because when we have a small output, it will reduce the overheads when we send that across the network. So for performance reasons, usually a fixed size small output. So the hash value, small. The message, any size. The hash value is n bits. The message is b bits in the previous slide. It needs to be easy to compute the hash of some message. The hash of x should be easy to compute. Okay, so fast. And then we have these properties that we saw already are needed for security. Except we'll define them in a bit more detail. Ah, last one. And we'll go to that quickly. The hash function should produce a random hash value. So the mapping from the message to the hash value should be a random mapping or a pseudo random mapping. If you take the hash of 0000, zero, zero, zero and get 00, zero, and then the next value and get the same 00, zero, the first four map to 00, zero, the next four map to 01, the third four to 0 to 10, and the last four messages to 11, one, one, that would not be a random mapping. There'll be some structure in that mapping. And that's a problem as well, because we can predict easier what the hash value or what the message would have been. So generally, we require the hash function to produce some random hash value as output. Let's look at these three properties. We'll just introduce them today, and we'll cover them in more detail next week. The pre-image resistant property is also called the one-way property. So they have two, two different names, mean the same thing. And that's what we've seen already. This requirement that if we know the hash value, lowercase h, it should be computationally infeasible, or practically impossible, to find the message y. Okay, so this is the inverse operation should be hard. If you know some value x, it should be easy to calculate the hash and get the hash value. But if you know the hash value, it should be hard to find the original message. That's called the one-way property. Our hash function should work one way. Easy one way, impossible the other way. Also called pre-image resistant. The next two properties are about collisions. And again, they have different names. You'll see different names. It's a bit confusing. Uh, I prefer to use the ones in brackets here. One-way property, weak and strong collision resistance. These weak collision resistant and strong collision resistant are about the ability to uh, not have collisions, no collisions. The first one says, if you have some message x, it should be practically impossible to find some other message, some other different message y, which has the same hash value as x. Okay. So you give me message x, I can find the hash of x. Okay, that's easy. Given the message x, it's easy to find the hash of x. But it should be practically impossible for me to find some other message y that also has the same hash value as x, okay. this collision. Uh, in this case, or it's not a good example, but message M30010 mapped to 10. Given that, I know the message M3, I know the hash value 10, what I'd like if my hash function has this weak collision resistant property, it means it should be practically impossible for me to find some other message that produces the hash value 10. 
In this case, it's easy for me to do it because the, the number of messages is quite small and the hash values are number of small, are small. But in general, it should be hard for me to find some other message that produces the same hash value, a collision in this case. We need this for our security mechanisms to work. Our signature relies on this property. If our hash function did not have this property, if I could find another message y with the same hash value as x, then I can defeat the security mechanisms that we went through in the previous slides. The last property is an extension of that. It's called strong collision resistance. It should be computationally infeasible to find any pair of messages, x and y, which have the same hash value. And this is the confusing part. Distinguish between these two properties. The first one, weak collision resistant, the attacker has some message x, they need to find some other message y with the same hash value. The second one, strong collision resistance, is the attacker has the opportunity to choose any two messages, X and Y, which have the same hash value. Which one is easier for the attacker to do? Strong or weak or strong collision resistance? From the attacker's perspective, which one do you think is easier? Strong collision resistance? Why? What? It's, the names get confusing, but think from not the name, but what the attacker needs to do. Which one do you think it's easier for the attacker? And hands up for weak. Hands up for strong. Easier for the attacker. Strong collision resistant is easier for the attacker to, to break. That is, so the attacker's objective is to find a collision. In weak collision resistance, the attacker is given some X. What they need to do is find some other message with the same hash value as X. With strong collision resistance, the attacker gets to choose any two messages. And any two messages that produce a, hash a, a collision. And that's easier because they've got more opportunity to find any combination of messages that produce a collision. There are messages that produce collisions. In in this case, the attacker just needs to find any pair that produce a collision. With weak collision resistance, they need to find one message that produces a collision with another given message. So it's easier for the attacker to defeat this property, the strong collision resistance. What we'll see next week is that some hash functions have, or some hash functions, depending upon where they're used, may have a selection of these properties, these three properties. Some don't need either, any of the properties. Some hash functions need one way property. We've seen an example. When we took the hash of the message concatenated with a secret, we required the one way property. And some hash functions need the weak collision resistant property, and others need the strong collision resistant property, depending upon the scenario when they're used. We'll go through next week some more examples, examples and explanation of the strong versus weak collision resistance. Looking at the birthday problem is one example. But there's a lot of. Uh, hard thinking to understand that, so let's stop there and let's finish with one example about something else, just quickly. First, before I show an example, just a packet capture with Wireshark, just a quick one. Any questions about what we've covered? 
these properties we will cover next week. We'll go through some more uh, discussion. For those four, actually there were six diagrams showing the authentication mechanisms. It's useful if you can think about them from the attacker's perspective. These types of diagrams. They show an authentication mechanism. To see how they work, one way to analyse them is think, OK, if I'm the attacker, what can I do? What can I do that will defeat the receiver? And that's a way to see how secure they are. And also understand the properties of hash, hash functions. You generally don't need to remember these mechanisms. For example, in an exam I'd give you this and then ask, what can the attacker t do to defeat this mechanism? Quick example to finish for today. An example of a hash function. Although it's in the later slides, some hash functions, the names of them, MD5 is one, SHA is another, the secure hash function. At the end of the slides, there's SHA1 and there's SHA2. Let's try them. And what I'm going to do is I've got a file on my computer. It's the lecture notes, the PDF of the, the slides that we've been presenting. It's 616,357 bytes long, that file. One way, or one place where you see hash functions applied is, is to check the integrity of files that you receive. Sometimes if you download a file, you may see on the website the hash the MD5 hash of that file. It's a way to check that the file you received matches the file on the server. Let's just quickly demonstrate that in use. On the command line in Linux, there are some functions to calculate the hash of a file. <coughs> Not a file name, but the contents of that file. One of them's MD5 sum, followed by the file name. So what this program does is uses the MD5 hash algorithm, so that's a specific hash function, takes the contents of this file, so the message is the 616,000 bytes, and produces, in this case, a 128-bit output. It's shown in hexadecimal. This d 521000 c there are 32 hexadecimal digits, each hexadecimal digit is 4 bits, so in binary this is 128 bits. So MD5 produces a 128 bit output, hash value. And takes a variable size input, in this case this, the input was my file of 616 kilobytes. Let's change the file. Let's just look at the, the contents of that file. Minus L in XXD shows me the first 50 bytes of the file. So this is the first 50 bytes of this PDF file in hexadecimal, and this is the ASCII PDF. This is just the PDF version. And if we look further, we'd see the, the PDF uh, uh, contents. Let's just change one bit in the file. And you've used this in one of your homeworks. We can use sed to replace a value. I'll replace the value 50 in hexadecimal with 51. That is, I'm going to take this file where there's a hexadecimal 50, which is in fact this second byte, replace it with hexadecimal 51. And output, let's say, to a new file, new.pdf. And let's 
look at the start of that new file. This new.pdf file, the one I just created, exact, is exactly the same as the original file except of this byte is different. Here it's 50 in the original file, it's 51 in the new file. So same size, in fact just one bit is different. Just check, same size. So both files now, 616, 357 bytes. Let's even rename the file. And just note, oh, actually we're not rename it, let's do it now, we're out of time. I'll calculate the MD5 hash value of the original file and we get this D5210 hash value and now calculate using the same algorithm of the new file which differs by one bit what am I going to get? A different hash value a completely different hash value and a random looking hash value so this is a simple demonstration that okay, two different inputs but differ just by one bit produce two different hash values. If I copy that file so now I have three files, one is a copy of the other and of course if we calculate what am I going to get? Different or the same as what's the first letter going to be in the hexadecimal hash of this. D. Okay. The hash, the MD5 is applied on the contents of the file, not the file name, it's got nothing to do with it. So all this is showing is that we're using a hash function, in this case it's MD5, there are others. This program takes the contents of the file and calculates the, the hash value. And this, with MD5 it's a 128 bit hash value or 32 hexadecimal digits. D52 up to 00 C. Modifying that file by just one bit produces a completely different hash value, 4E19, so on. Same contents, different file name, of course we get the same hash value. Okay. So we'll see in later examples, maybe you'll, you'll see and use SHA, SHA1, SHA2, MD5. You've probably seen MD5 in a number of places on the internet, password files and so on. You will have a homework where you will need to use and understand hash functions and see how they're used in signatures. Enough for today. Next week we'll come back and look at these properties for collision resistance.